here is a view of the coagulation cascade. This image is complicated, but this cascade implies that there is a top to bottom or right to left unbridled reaction that marches forward. And so this is true in the lab because I have such potent reagents that can drive the reactions forward without really looking backwards much or forwards. Um, but it just isn't the truth in vivo. So let's talk a bit about in vitro hemostasis, but acknowledge that this is only true in the lab. If we accept that there are intrinsic and extrinsic pathways that converge onto the common pathway, and they converge on the rate-limiting step of the common pathway, which is activation of factor 10 to its activated form, factor 10A, this reaction occurs very rapidly and can be stimulated either by the extrinsic branch in vitro or by the intrinsic branch in vitro. Ultimately, factor 10A in the presence of its cofactor is going to rapidly convert a small amount of prothrombin to thrombin. And this small amount of thrombin is all that is required to convert fibrinogen, which is clotting factor number one, to the fibrin-rich clot. Now, the extrinsic pathway is a direct beeline for the common pathway. So it's a quick route to get to the rate-limiting step. Now, in vitro, this is the extrinsic pathway that involves two players predominantly. Factor 7, which gets activated, and tissue factor, its cofactor. And then that is rapidly going to lead to the activation of factor 10. Of course, other important cofactors are required, including calcium and phospholipids. And I'll talk about why we have to add those things back in vitro in a moment. So you could very justifiably ask me, why do we need the intrinsic pathway at all? You've just taken us to the rate limiting step and you've already generated thrombin that results in the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. So why is the intrinsic pathway needed? Well, in vitro, I can activate the system from the very top of the intrinsic pathway, which starts with our early contact factors, of which factor 12 is one of them. Now, when factor 12 gets activated with the use of a contact activator, which is a part of one of the reagents for PTT tests, it converts to activated factor 12, but then quickly converts factor 11 to factor 11A. We're skipping factor 10 because we've already used it as the rate limiting step. And we're moving directly to the activation of factor nine. Now factor nine in the presence of its cofactor factor eight is again going to lead to the conversion of factor 10 to 10A. But here's where things get kind of complicated. So in vitro, I can activate factor 10A from the intrinsic pathway directly without the extrinsic pathway, but in vivo, these things don't really happen this way. And so in fact, this whole intrinsic pathway in the lab is actually the amplification pathway in vivo. And the extrinsic pathway in the lab is the initiation pathway in vivo. And so you're never going to generate thrombin without activation of the initiation pathway, which is going to get activated by endothelial damage. Otherwise, there's, that's pathological and we shouldn't be generating clots without endothelial damage. And in vivo, the amplification pathway is going to lead to a lot of positive feedback and communication back from the extrinsic and common pathway to the intrinsic pathway or the amplification pathway. That's going to lead to a lot of cycling through the activation of factor 10 to 10A that ultimately is going to be responsible for a big thrombin burst. And that thrombin burst is what is required for activation of our clot stabilizers. And so you can form an initial fibrin-rich clot with very little thrombin, but you require a very large concentration of thrombin to have activation of our clot stabilizers. So this is our body's way to say, we formed a clot. Now, are you certain that you want us to stabilize this clot? Do you want this clot to hang around for a while, for a minimum of 90? And so the amplification pathway, which hinges on functional factor eight and factor nine as the core 
amplifier complex is so important to the formation of a stable fibrin rich clot, which is why patients with hemophilia experience delayed and deep tissue bleeding. Mm. 